Everybody, I'm really humbled to be here. Very inspiring speakers. Thank you, TEDx Bitspilani. Uh, I'm Subesh Kar, and I'm an undergraduate here at Bitspilani. I'm 20 years old. I'm one of the audience. I'm one of you guys. And what I'm going to be talking about is finding the contrarian truth. And my talk is not going to be an, a, a manual or a record of knowledge that I'm going to dump on everybody. But it's going to actually be an exercise, and I want everyone to play along. An exercise in starting from scratch and doing new things. Now, what does doing new things mean? Now, in a book called Zero to One by Peter Thiel, Peter Thiel sort of describes the future of progress in two steps. Um, it's either horizontal or extensive progress, which means going from one to n, copying things that work. The other sort of progress is much more difficult, vertical or intensive progress, which means starting from scratch and doing new things, going from zero to one. Now, if you take a horse and you say, okay, let me make 100 horses, that's going from one to n. Now, if you say, take a horse and you say, oh, this is pretty useless, and you invent an automobile that's going from zero to one. Now, who am I to be talking about this? So, uh, a year back, I was in Texas, and I had the privilege of being invited to the SpaceX Hyperloop Pod uh, Design Weekend. And this is the collection of everyone in the world, uh, academics, students, professionals, working on something called the Hyperloop, which is a fifth mode of transport after cars, planes, trains, and ships, uh, proposed first by SpaceX and uh, Tesla CEO Elon Musk. And this is the valedictory ceremony that's coming to an end but the atmosphere is sort of electric with anticipation. Everyone's going to be waiting, oh, what's going to happen next? And suddenly, out of nowhere, Elon Musk stop, steps up on stage. And I'm standing in the front row, and everyone sort of collectively blows their minds. And something that Musk said sort of has stuck to me, stuck with me since, and he said, it's clear that the world and the public, and he refers to the Hyperloop, they want something new. And then he refers to the students in the crowd. It's clear the world and public want something new, and you guys are going to deliver it to them. So, first of all, before exploring this further, I want to briefly explore what the Hyperloop is. Now, the Hyperloop is sort of the blank canvas for transportation. It's a fifth and a new mode of transportation. And this was just too, way too exciting for me. So, uh, I decided to found a team to bring the Hyperloop to India. Uh, the Hyperloop is sort of, quickly describe what the Hyperloop is. It's sort of a combination of the speed of an airplane and the capacity of a train and the convenience of a car. Which, which is achieved through a maglev system based uh, and with tubes. Now, how many sort of Futurama fans out here? Quick show of hands. Right. So the fight hyperloop might remind you of the sort of tube transport system in Futurama, where people just uh, whiz past here and there uh, at, at the touch of a button. But the difference between Futurama and hyperloop is that the hyperloop is actually happening. Uh, this, the, this thing you see behind me are the tubes which are actually being developed. The, spa the, sp the company called SpaceX is building a scaled-down one-mile one mile track, but they're inviting student teams like ours to build a Hyperloop pod vehicle to test on this track, and that's what our sort of vehicle looks like. Now, when we started off, we sort of started off just with the engineering part, uh, the manufacturing, the magnetic levitation, the uh, electronics, the control systems. Then we discovered, when we went and talked to governments, we discovered that that's just making technology isn't an enough to, make, to sell something. So we, then we started to develop the business case, the government and policy part, the transport planning part. So we roped in teams from IIM Ahmedabad, the Indian School of Business, to help us do that. And now we're sort of this unique, uh, multidisciplinary, multi-campus team, uh, which is sort of the first of its sort, which is working on all aspects of the Hyperloop. And uh, we're completely made up of students. Right now we had recruitments in IIT Madras, and we had 170 applications from students in IIT Madras sort of a student movement of sorts. And, but I'm not here to talk about the Hyperloop. That's a different TEDx talk. <laughs> what I'm here to talk about is sort of the, what I've learned while building a student team which has never been built before, while making students deal with something which has never been dealt with by students before, while dealing with the Hyperloop, which is sort of a new mode of transport never been tested before. This has taught me the value of sort of starting from scratch and doing new things, and especially as a member of Generation Y, or an undergraduate in India. And most of us, when we start off uh, doing new things, we ask ourselves a lot of questions. And this takes me to my favorite book, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And in this book, uh, human beings build this large supercomputer called Deep Thought. And they ask it, okay, so what is the answer to the ultimate question of the life, the universe, and everything? And this computer takes 7.5 million years. And then it sort of spits out an answer. It says 42. 
And human beings are gobsmacked, like, that's a complicated question, and you have a simple answer, 42. And uh, what Deep Thought says is the answer is pretty simple, but what you have to figure out is the right question. When most of us figure out, the most questions I get is, oh, is this, does this have the right scope? Will this good, look good in my resume? Uh, is this the right time to do it? And these are all good questions, but this is not the right question. The right question when you sort of want to start off and do new things sort of looks like this. It's called the contrarian question, and I want everybody in the audience to sort of look at this very, very carefully. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? Now, a quick show of hands, how many people have a good answer to this question? Just raise your hand if you have ever had an unpopular opinion which you have thought was important. Quick show of hands. <laughs> yeah, so this question actually looks very, very simple and straightforward, but it's actually very, very difficult to answer. If you think about it, it's intellectually difficult because most of the stuff that we are taught is by definition agreed upon, and it's psychologically different because you have to voice an opinion which is by definition unpopular. Now, the future is sort of the sum of all the events which are yet to come. If you can sort of ignore what is agreed upon in the past and the present and c formulate a good answer, that is the closest you can come to looking at the future. The most bad answers are sort of uh, different ways of looking at the present. The first two answers you see on the slide are sort of something which is a, sort of universally agreed upon. I mean, everyone thinks that they're true and it's not something unique to you. The second two are take a familiar side in a, uh, take a side in a very familiar debate. All good answers can be sort of formed in the way most people believe in X, but the, X, but the truth is op often the opposite of X. Now, not just believe from a blind faith standpoint, but critically analyze something. Now, what contrarianism, why it's so useful, is because it's the habituated form of critical thinking oriented towards falsification. Now, whenever a contrarian comes across anything, any new thing, a, 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 an idea, a fact, a thesis, an observation, his first instinct, cognitive instinct, is to flip it on its head. Now, what, what, why this is an efficient first step, it, it's, it's essentially the low-hanging fruit of falsification. I mean, you don't need any, need any research and analysis to flip something on its head or invert or vary it. The other reason it's useful is because it's automatic. Now, uh, you don't really need any, uh, it quickly varies an argument and shows how easily it can be proved to be not what not it is, and hence it questions its legitimacy as conventional wisdom. Now, what does this exactly mean? Now, what this means is every single one of you who raised their hands has and has an unpopular opinion which other people don't agree with you on, has the potential seed of an idea that can go on to become something that the world hasn't seen yet. And if I do a good job today, then probably most of you at the end will have some sort of idea as to the contrarian truth. It's gonna be really exciting. Okay, so let's, let's begin with giving this some sort of context, okay. Um, the first sort of uh, a, a way to contextualize this question is to say, okay, what contrarian question business? What valuable company is nobody building? Now, not all of us are here to build companies. I mean, you can do anything. You can start a new project. You can start a new skill set, a new perspective, a new relationship. You can even start from scratch, have no previous experience whatsoever, ignore all tenets of conventional wisdom, and become president of the USA. And now, you, you, you guys may laugh, but Trump is sort of the ultimate contrarian. I mean, he ignored all conventional wisdom, and still ended up grabbing America by the ballots. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> now, the contrarian question for individuals sort of looks something like this. I mean, what you guys should be asking yourself is, what problem does no one see? What valuable skill is nobody developing? What opportunity does no one see? And what unique individual is nobody becoming? So when I started off this TED Talk, how I started is, what TED talk is no one giving, right? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so the, the secret to a good contrarian truth, a good contrarian answer, is always rooted in a good secret. Now, what is a secret? A secret is something which is known only to you, not, not to the guy sitting next to you, not to me, not to the audience, not to your friends, not to your parents. It's something which is important yet unknown, which is hard but doable. Now, a secret, now, if everyone was, if, if secrets were so easy to find, everybody would be doing new things, but everybody's not. So why is it so difficult to look for secrets? And why it's so difficult is because whenever you want to look for secrets, our brain sort of goes through this, this algorithm. Okay, so if something has been done, only then it's possible. 
If something has not been done, then it's impossible. And something is a good idea and it's possible, then it's probably been done. Now, what, what, the, 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 now a brain goes through this algorithm, and then it shuts down. Oh, this is too much processing power. Let me quickly go to imitating stuff. Let me copy stuff now. Um, the way to sort of think about, to get around this way of thinking, is what I call thinking like a physicist. Um, now, I, had for, I, I, had for, I was fortunate enough to study physics for the first two years of my uh, college in BITS. I also did physics under Dr. Stephen Wolfram and at MIT. And this, what, what this taught me is the importance of thinking like a physicist. Now, this is how normal people get ideas. Uh, this, is, this is, by the way, the best talk image that you can get when you search for light bulb on head. <laughs> uh, but this is how normal people think of ideas. Now, how a physicist would look at this and say, okay, this is an interesting light bulb. Let me zoom in. Oh, there's a tungsten filament that's glowing. Interesting. Let me zoom in further. Oh, there's a layer of tungsten atoms. Let me zoom in further. Oh, there's a, there's a set of electrons getting excited and de-excited when you apply electrical energy. And this is leading to release of photons in a visible wavelength. <laughs> this is how a physicist thinks of it. A physicist looks at the world for what it is in terms of atoms and molecules. And that is what sort of allows physicists to come up with crazy contrarian ideas like quantum mechanics. And how most of us think is we reason by analogy. We say, okay, something has been done before, so I'll do it that way. Or someone said that this was how it's done before, so I'll do it that way. What a physicist does is he plays something called the why question. And if you want to reach the contrarian truth, you have to also play the why question. First, what you have to do is you have to take all conventional wisdom and you just have to chuck it into the dustbin. And if you have any of it left, then you attack it with a series of whys. You say, okay, why this, why that, why this, why that? And, if you, and then you reach a floor. And if that floor is a fundamental truth, if, it, if it's a fact, a data, a, a, a figure, or an undisputable truth, then that's a good place to start. That's a first principles way of thinking. Now, if that, if that floor so sounds like, oh, because Dash said so, because my parents said so, my friend said so, because society says so, because religion says so, because this guy standing on the TEDx stage said so, then, then you're setting yourself up for copying. Uh, you can't do new things. The next thing that you sort of realize as Generation Y, as students, is that you really have nothing to lose. Now, most of us don't take risks. Most of us don't look for secrets because we fear. We fear, uh, uh, we, uh, we make decisions based on fear disguised as practicality. Now, last year uh, when I was in America, I was in a shoestring budget. And I decided to run, run, run an experiment. So I lived on a food budget of $60, which is around 4,000 rupees which is pretty uh, expensive in America. <laughs> and I decided to live on a food budget of that much for a month. And I survived. I didn't starve to death. And this taught me two things. First thing is that you can have instant noodles with anything. You can anything. It, it, tastes, it tastes really bad, <laughs> but you can have it with anything. That's the first thing it taught me. The second thing it taught me is that I, this is, that's the bare minimum. $60 would be the bare minimum I would need to not starve to death. And this sort of gave me the confidence that I could do anything. I, I didn't have to worry about things like money. I mean, money would come, but I could do whatever I wanted without, I could start whatever I wanted without having to worry about fear. And it'll quickly, uh, and so you're not going to starve to death. You're not going to die of exposure. You sort of have to ask yourself, what's the worst that could go wrong? Now, there's another scary fact which I want to put in front of you people. Now, look at this table. This is a list of all countries by the highest GDP. And you have First of all, China, European Union, USA, and India. And India is a sort of the last two figures are the most important. India is the world's fastest growing economy. Our growth rate is 7.6%. And our current median age is the lowest. It's 27, which, which is a scary fact, is that 50% of our 1.25 billion uh, population is below the age of 25, which is the age of you and me. This is scary because this is like having a very fast rocket which is hurtling into oblivion and it's being completely controlled by a bunch of kindergartners. Now, if the kindergartners don't stop sucking their thumbs and actually do something and control the rocket, the rocket's gonna crash. And this sort of underscores our responsibility as Generation Y, as students, to take risks, to, um, to venture out where others haven't, to rethink conventional career paths and do things and do new things which haven't been done before. The last thing that I want to point out is, okay, so when you have something unique, a secret, how do you sustain it? Um, 
here conventional wisdom fails us again. You have to avoid competition like the plague. Now, conventional wisdom tells us that competition is a good thing. Uh, the truth is the opposite of that. Com the, actually, the more we compete, the less we gain. If you imagine value as a cake, and everyone's competing for the same cake, then everyone gets a smaller slice. But competition has been so ingrained into our ideology from the very beginning, it distorts our way of thinking. Uh, IIT, JE, 10 standard, 10, 12 standard, every, everything sort of puts a mark or a grade on our competitiveness. And people who are good at this get status and credentials and their face on the side of a bus, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so um, if you want to uh, do new things, the first step is to escape competition. And the way to escape competition is to become a monopolist. Now, the, the difference is very, very subtle. So I want two things from the audience. Uh, I want a name, and I want a unique hobby. Any, any name? Rajesh, OK. A unique hobby, any unique hobby that not a lot of people do. Dog farming? OK, brilliant. So we have Rajesh. And Rajesh does dog farming. Um, now, now, Rajesh thinks of himself as a unique individual. So Rajesh has a 9 CGPA. Uh, he has a 1.4 crore package uh, from an IT company. Um, not going to name the company. <laughs> he's the leader of a club. And as a hobby, he does dog farming. Right? Now, Rajesh, if he was a non-monopolist, what he would say is he would describe all his skill sets as an intersection, he would look around himself and say, oh, there's no one like me. So what he would do is he would define his skill set as an intersection of all these larger skill sets, a narrow intersection. So he would say, oh, I'm in a league of my own. I'm unique, but I'm unique by definition. So he, what Rajesh does, he draws a small pond around himself. He says, oh, I'm the biggest fish in this pond. And the problem with this is that once you're the biggest fish in the pond, you're opening yourself up to competition. No one likes the biggest fish in the pond. So everyone wants to compete with the biggest fish in the pond. Not only that, you're also opening yourself up to stagnation. Once you feel you're the biggest fish in the pond, you never try to expand. You never try to grow your monopoly. Now, non-monopolists always get crushed. What, what Rajesh would do if he was a monopolist, would, he would say, OK, I have a 9 CGPA, but so do the 100,000 people in the 10,000 colleges of this country. I have a 1.4 crore package. But so does everyone who joined that same IT company at my pay scale. I do dog farming, but so do the thousand people in the million of the, the countries all over the world. So Rajesh, Rajesh as once he has a monopolist worldview, what he does is he defines his pond as a union, not an intersection, a union of various bigger ponds. And he defines himself as a smaller fish in that pond. He portrays himself as that. The two advantages of this is it allows him to escape competition. No one wants to compete with the small fish in the pond, so he can, sus he can sustain his monopoly forever. And not only that, it also gives him a broader worldview, so he knows exactly how to expand his monopoly. Now, the, this, the, uh, the lesson from the book called Sun Tzu is that there is no instance of a nation benefiting from prolonged warfare. And competition between individuals is essentially like warfare. It's apparently necessary, it's allegedly valiant, but ultimately it's destructive. We should always aim to become a monopolist and get the whole cake every time. And now, if anyone still has a doubt about a contrarian truth, and I hope everyone's thinking along with me, there's one last guy who might be able to help you, and that guy is Socrates. And what Socrates says is how, how to think about common sense statements or conventional wisdom is the first thing you do is you identify a statement that seems like common sense. The best jobs are highly paid. or being successful needs a good CGPA. Then you try to find an exception to the statement. Oh, can I be in a highly paid job and still be miserable? Okay, or is there anyone who's successful and with a bad CGPA? And once you have, you find an exception, that means your original statement has an imprecision. Now you try to nuance your original statement, taking this exception into account. Can I uh, have a uh, can I have a low paying job and still be happy? Or do I want to, what I want to be successful at? Does it require a good CGPA? Then you continue this process for as long as possible, continuing to find exceptions to your original common sense statement. And then you will find the contrarian truth. The truth, for, as, for anyone who's trying to reach the truth, lies in that statement, which is impossible to disprove. Now, 
I'm working on the Hyperloop, but transportation is just one of our problems. We have poverty, education, healthcare, women empowerment, space exploration, uh, climate change. There's so many problems, and it'll need thousands of people like you and me working on thousands of contrarian answers and contrarian truths to find innovative solutions to all these problems where conventional wisdom has failed us. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you either have a contrarian truth to start off with, or you know how to go about exploring one. So in the words of my favorite characters, Calvin Hobbes, let's go exploring. Thank you. <laughs>